We Strategy Implementation Subcommittee uh, on Friday the 6th of March. Um, I'll remind members that this, this uh, will be recorded for public listening uh, and can actually put your phones on silent um, for the, the duration of the, the subcommittee. The first thing we've got to do is I said an apology, so can I ask Clark Tracy for the said an apologies, please? Thank you, Chair. We've got nine members present. Thank you. Um, any declarations of interest? Just an apology, Chair. I will be leaving a bit early. That's okay, all. thanks, Thank you. Ian. Thank you. Um, we then move on to the minute of the previous meeting of the 10th of October, and this minute is for noting. Are we happy for that to be noted? Thank you. And at item number four, waste strategy update on community conversations, curbside rollout, household waste recycling centre survey and approval of refuse and recycling collections operational policy and procedures and report by heads of roads and infrastructure. The purpose of this report is to provide members with outcomes and feedback from the waste community conversations held <coughs> during October and November 2019 and the public consultation on proposed changes to the hours of operation of the household waste recycling centres. The report also provides an update on the ordering of a new fleet of refuse collection vehicles and details of the up updated refuse and recycling collections operational policy and procedures. This was updated to reflect the proposed curbside rollout addressing feedback from the waste community conversation, including the size of bins and road end collections. And before I ask members if they have any questions for the report author, I'd like to advise that both myself and Katie sought commitment from officers to engage with the Youth Council with regards to the waste strategy development. I can advise that officers have made contact with Mark Malloy and arranged a meeting for later in the month to engage the Youth Council in the next steps in the waste collection rollout, including ways to promote the service and the waste hierarchy of reduce, reuse and recycle. The team will also look to other opportunities uh, to engage the Youth Council in the continued development of the strategy and before I open it to members, is there anything you need to ask or add, Stephen? Nothing to add to the report, Chair. Thank you. James? Yes, Chair. Can I just make a correction to uh, it's page 16, uh, item uh, well, paragraph 3.7.4. In brackets on the third line, it says Wednesday to Sunday. That should read Thursday to Monday. So we'll see that that's corrected in, in a minute. That's okay. Okay, members, any questions, queries? John? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, got a, uh, a few points. Uh, the first one is on page 5, 1.2. Uh, I take it that's a, a, an error where it says troll out rather than roll out. <laughs> <laughs> the second point, Chair, is uh, the Greystone Foundation. I'm not sure what that is. When you Google it, it seems to be some sort of uh, cult, in my opinion, where they, they're asking for money. I'm just wondering why that was in the, the reference in the paper, especially in the table uh, on page 8, because, I mean, there's, there's been no feedback or surveys or anything like that. Should, should we really be considering the Greystone Foundation's uh, part of that? Third point I would like to make is uh, page 6. Uh, the technology is not sufficiently advanced to it to acquire electric or hydrogen power vehicles. I find that kind of hard to believe. Again, if you go on Google, you can actually see there's a number of electrical uh, vehicles that can be used. Uh, I, I, I don't know if the, the, the officers uh, can give us a, a bit of insight uh, to how much or what sort of in-depth, uh, you know, that they've looked into this. That's the three points, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> James? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, with respect to the typo, yep, that's completely my fault. Apologies for that. Can't believe it wasn't picked up by, by those checking. Um, secondly, in terms of the Greystone Foundation, uh, the Greystone Foundation are the ones that operate uh, the uh, David Keswick uh, sports facilities on behalf of the Council. They ran uh, an event on uh, sort of reuse and recycling, and they asked whether, so there were a number of different groups there, Cycle, Cycling Dumfries and, and uh, others associated with reducing the carbon footprint, uh, and they asked whether the council could be involved in that event. So at quite short notice, um, three of us attended that event. So it was a different group of people to engage with, quite often kids. So it was it was quite a good good one. It could have been done with better promotion, and we'll support them in a future event to promote that better. So it isn't the environment fair, but it was a sort of similar 
similar thing to the council involvement in the environment fair. In terms of the technology, um, so I was at um, an APSI event earlier this year uh, in Manchester where one of the big companies, one of the big suppliers of uh, HGVs um, and particularly uh, uh, road sweepers and uh, RCVs presented on the technology they pulled together for um, a hydro electric stroke hydrogen powered vehicle. So um, that what they're saying is that um, they are looking to manufacture manufacture these kind of vehicles. Um, the costs are still prohibitive. So for a standard electric RCV that they they were putting out, it's twice the cost of a uh, an RCV, a diesel powered RCV. Um, so we need to be mindful of that in terms of you know availability of capital monies for for that. Um, that's the basic electric powered HGV that they were offering. Um, what they're then saying is that to put the hydrogen packs onto that HGV, uh, onto the RCV would push up the costs even further. Um, they're talking of a manufacturer of, I think it was 60 this coming year. Now they're a European manufacturer. So realistically, um, they, they, having spoken to them directly after the presentation, they wouldn't be looking to be putting out fleets to, to, to councils in that respect. Um, we do, or we will be receiving uh, a, an, H, uh, an, an electric RCV through Scottish Power, a funding from Scottish Power. Um, that's got a range of 60 miles, so suitable for doing wards like Dumfries or areas like Dumfries, but clearly not suitable for the longer distance routes. Um, I think what we need to what we need to be doing over the next five years, as it says, is very much. Uh, looking at how we set up our operations so that in five years' time when we replace the vehicles, uh, we're in a position then to uh, have the technology available on our site. So the new park, which we're putting in there, I think has, is it four? Four electric charging points being built into the RCV storage area, but also the capacity to do more. So it's that kind of technology that we would we would want to put in. So. Can I just clarify a point that you said there, James, um, the, the Scottish Power funding that we get was over five years. Um, my understanding was two RCVs rather than one. My understanding was it was two RCVs as well, but we believe we've got one due to arrive. I'm not sure when the second one's arriving. Thank you. Ian? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I did have a question on, on that last point as well. I just wondered in five years, do you think we'll be able to have a, a full fleet is what I was thinking. I don't know if that was maybe answered or no. It was in part, I suppose. But 3.5 in page 13, it's also contained within the recommendations at 2.8. So I just want to get a, a wee bit more detail in regards to that, please, if that's possible. So I'm thinking, there's a private road, I'm thinking, Chairman, in your ward, Eaglesfield, is it the Croft? Do you know we got through into the Croft? So that's private road, so it's full-size adoptable standards. So it just, it's... So the, there's length, 30 metres is mentioned, but the actual dimensions of the roads, turn and circle, stuff like that, isn't mentioned in, in some private roads. So, so it, it's been a, a road that's up to, built up to adoptable standards after 1984, but it's never been formally adopted by the council. Still belongs to maybe about 14 or 15 units in there, I think, isn't it? Uh, just using that as an example of yourself being sitting at the chair. I just wondered, so there's, I'm thinking the one in Clansfield, I've mentioned it in the past, maybe on this committee and others, so we've got something of a similar size and scale. So when there's properties, so there's probably... A, 13 or 14 units down there as well, where there is acts available to, to, to safely reverse or drive down, turn and come back, uh, but it is a private road. And there's a number of these across, there's one in Breaker, actually, Lady Street is similar. Uh, so uh, there's a number of these across the police and guards. So they're, they're not like two or three metre wide. It isn't an arrow. They're five and a half, six, seven, six and a half metres wide. What, how does the policy apply to it in those particular terms? Thanks, Ryan. Just to, just to add to that, of course, we've also said that you know when it comes to the planning of any new um, housing areas and things like that, they need to take into consideration the waste collection service, which they haven't done for the last 10, 15 years. So, James, can you end? Is it Janice? Yeah, Chair. I, I mean, with respect to collection, I mean, the important bit is that the road is up to the standards that are set out in the collection uh, policy, the operational policy and procedure. So if it is wide enough to drive down and there is a turning area, it's to avoid the reversing, it's to avoid the tight bends, it's to avoid the soft shoulders that the vehicles end up reversing onto and then falling over, as you've seen in previous pictures to this committee, uh, to avoid hitting buildings, getting damaged from overhanging branches and such like. So 
as long as the road's maintained to a standard and it has the suitable width and turning areas, then there wouldn't be a change to, to what we would do. But it is very much a case-by-case -case basis that we'll be looking at doing this. But it has been implemented pretty much fully in the west of the region because of foot and mouth. No, thanks very much for that. And thanks for it. We've had issues, personal issues, not personal to me, but local constituents' issues, and the teams worked very well in regards to addressing those problems. So I'd like to thank them uh, publicly, Chair. Thank you, Ian. Um, Jeff, then Jim. Thanks, Archie. It's just a couple of minor points to do with the uh, comments in the Appendix 4. And I attended the, uh, the, uh, the event at Heath Hall. It was very well attended, and I found it very useful. And uh, speaking to people there, I think they did as well. Um, but an issue which was raised was uh, disposal of cooking oil. Um, have we got facilities, or will we have the facilities for doing that? And the other one is uh, disposal of uh, paint. Having inherited my late father-in-law's extensive collection of partially used paint cans, it's amazing how difficult it is to get rid of it and how much uh, cat litter a, a five-litre tin of um, uh, emulsion paint will use. So I think it would be a general concern is how do you get rid of these things? We don't want them going into the, uh, the general waste, obviously. James? I'll just introduce Kirk, who works at our HWRCs and manages the HWRCs across the region. Hi. Um, paint has been a, a, a smaller issue in the grand scheme of things at the minute. Uh, isolated incidents like for yourself, where you've got, you know, a, a, quite a number of tins, we found to be very rare. So in the meantime, asking the public to either leave the tins open or to add a hardener to it has been a, a resolve just now. But it's something in the background that we're looking at to see if we can make it a, because it is a specific waste stream. We would need to add that to our licenses. We would need to get the receptacles to accept that. So it's something in the future that we're considering. However, at the moment, um, there's not a, a great demand for larger numbers of paint pots coming in. So in the meantime, it's a case of trying to harden it. Jeff? But my concern is that the people will be just putting them in the general waste and cover them over. So, you know, they are going into the general waste. Yes, very small amounts, maybe a couple of tins that are maybe say a quarter full that go in the general waste. As long as they're sealed, they'll go into the back of the RCVs. Uh, the main thing is they're not going into the waste, the water course, that are not going, you know, but they'll go to the Echo Deco plant and they will get processed and through that plant for recovery. Jim? Thanks, Chair. Sure. Sure. Uh, a two or three wee points. Uh, page nine, there's a reference there to the Scottish Government's deposit return scheme. Does this scheme only apply to glass bottles? Because I, I have read national newspaper reports indicating that plastic will also feature in the scheme. Um, yeah, Chair, DR, DRS uh, applies to all single-use drinks containers, so it would be glass bottles, cans, and plastic bottles. So principally, uh, gla glass, obviously, cans would be aluminium or steel, but generally aluminium, and plastic bottles would, would generally be PET, which is the number one within the recycling code. It doesn't apply to milk bottles, so it doesn't apply to the HDPE bottles, which are, you know, it's a sort of softer, squashier material. Um, but it does apply to Coke bottles and other, other soft drinks bottles. So it could have implications for the curbside uh, recycling service if a lot of the plastic is actually going uh, into the deposit return scheme. Yeah, that is, that is completely correct, and, and it's um, one of the reasons uh, that local authorities are, are all working in conjunction with Zero Waste Scotland and Scottish Government to look at the impacts of DRS upon the, the curbside collection service. So authorities that collect glass curbside will likely look to remove that service. Um, the authorities that uh, do a lot of curbside separation um, will likely be more impacted because uh, the, value, the valuable products principally are PET, uh, number one, and HDPE. So if you remove the PET, uh, because it's generally going to be within DRS, um, then you lose the, the, some of the value of what the council's collecting, so the, the costs of collection are not offset to the same extent 
by the um, by the sort of money that can be made or the avoidance, you know, the income that can be made from selling the, the plastics on or selling it, getting getting rid of it at a lower gate fee than general waste goes as. Um, so yeah, you're correct. It it, it will be a, an impact. So fortunately, our service is being designed to be quite a simple service. Uh, we're also looking to incorporate pots, tubs, and trays within the plastics mix, which will increase the, the, the amount of plastic and reduce the amount in the residual waste, which obviously is a more expensive disposal route. Another point, Chair. Page 13, there's reference at the top there to any future move to a three-weekly collection service. Now, given that in most of the Friesen Gallery, the residual bin contains food waste. Is this a practical proposition? James? It is. Um, I think what we're trying to do at the moment, uh, Chair, is to establish, um, um, I guess, a strategy that incorporates as much flexibility in the service that we deliver now and in the future. I'm, I'm certainly not saying that uh, going to a three-weekly collection service for residual waste is something that we should be forced to do, something that we may end up doing. I'm, I'm not making that decision at this stage. What I'm suggesting is that should that be a way that goes forward to reduce collection costs, because clearly a high percentage of our cost for the waste service is in collection, and if we can reduce the cost by reducing the frequency of collection, um, then that would be you know, offer savings to the authority. If we go to the point was being if we reduce the residual waste capacity below 240 litres, uh, i.e. replace existing 240 litre bins with, with 160s, which would be equivalent to a two-weekly service, we would kind of scupper ourselves from being able to in future ever consider a three-weekly collection service. So I've put that in to explain it. It's not by, it's not sort of by stealth that I'm proposing a three-weekly collection service. But we, but there are authorities in Scotland with a three-weekly residual waste collection service. Okay, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's loads of information in the report in front of us, and you know you can just see that by the number of recommendations that we're we're looking at. There's 11 in total, many of which are for noting, um, and certainly just on reflection, the community conversations I attended, the one in Stranraer and the one in Newton Stewart, and it was fantastic. I think there was a lot of people got some direct answers to questions and concerns. And I think, you know, more of these events are, you know, really a way forward. Um, just on that particular point, in terms of the communication, we're, we're implementing the new strategy here, but there's no, there's no communication plan in here and there's no timeline. And just to note that, that actually that's something that we possibly need for the future going forward. Um, and in terms of the communication, online will the information about paint um one of my colleagues brought up the issues of batteries you know we don't want our batteries going into residual waste they should be recycled should, can we get that information put on the website and clear information because it's all very well having a great new strategy but unless people in Dumfries and galloway know what the next stages are you know they're, they're not going to know what what the situation is with that and also pots tubs and trays can we also mention Tetra Packs? Because um, um, my understanding is we do now recycle those as well. Um, in terms of the recommendations, Chair, we've got in 2.3 agreed to issue the 44 litre boxes to households to aid the storage and transportation of dry recyclates. There's no approach of how we would do that. And certainly in discussions with other members, we've brought up previously, will these be available at the at the reusable centres that are, you know, for people to come and collect, rather than just simply issue a black box to every household in Dumfries and Galloway, will people be able to come and collect those? And obviously, if somebody isn't able to collect because they've got an assistance or they need assistance, we can then perhaps arrange for those specific ones. But I just maybe to ask other members how they feel, because my understanding is if we then start issuing boxes to every household, every household may not want those. My final point that I wanted to bring up was in terms of adding green waste at a future. So in 3.3.7, garden slash green waste, the last paragraph 
states in there that in due course a report will be brought to this subcommittee. Now, looking at the delegation for this subcommittee, we are monitoring and overseeing the implementation of the new waste strategy. If green waste is part of that, then it would absolutely be appropriate to come back here. But if we're not looking at this stage at green waste, I would maybe suggest that that goes back to the to communities committee to take that one forward for the future. So it was just maybe the wording of that one. But there's a couple of points in there maybe to get feedback on. Okay, James. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, in, in terms of the communications, um, communications plan and timetable, it is something that we are um, obviously looking at uh, at present. We're, we're, you'll see we are progressing with the vehicle purchase, um, looking to the bins purchase. Um, we're getting some advice on when you would roll out a curbside collection service, and we're needing to get these some some definitive dates on things like the the vehicle, uh, you know, arrival times of vehicles, um, and when we would be able to get the bins. There's some pretty important elements to that. So, I mean, a simple one is to say we need the vehicles before we can roll out the curbside collection service. We need the bins before we can roll out the curbside collection service. We don't want to be rolling out the bins be before. Um, we have the service in place. So two weeks before the new service starts would be when you would get your wheelie bin. No, no earlier than that because the bins then are, are not being used. So we're we're pulling together a program on that. And yes, we would look to present that back to this committee when when we have more confidence in that. Pots, tubs, and trays, and tetra packs. Yes, tetra packs are part of the the dry recycle mix within that bin of metals and pot and plastics. Um, the 44 litre box issue. So our intention is. And this comes out of um, actually a request through uh, through one of the uh, a local one of the members um, from from the from a community council meeting, but uh, the 44 litre box issue would be through the HWRCs. So we would we're looking to to take pallets of boxes to all our HWRCs, um, and we will uh, we're pulling together um, sort of forms that the public would. Comply with GDPR. They would read a, a document that would say we will take your name and address, so that we don't end up issuing to the same household hundreds of them. Uh, that, that, that's to kind of avoid that. I think we would look to do some work to sort of try and align the, the issue of the boxes to the new curbside collection service, so potentially up to three boxes per household if they wished. Um, when these things are still slightly in discussion, um, green waste, the communities committee. Uh, yeah, absolutely fine. As, as, as other things develop with the strategy, if this committee, this subcommittee is no longer sitting, we would take anything to communities. Okay. Ellie and then John. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, it's, uh, page 10, 3.3.12. I have to say, I maybe should have been aware that there, there was an intention by the Scottish Government to review rural exemptions for food waste, but I wasn't. Uh, and uh, I just wondered where that was, because uh, as you say, later on, there is a, a financial cost to the council should this come in, and clearly that would be the case for other rural authorities, uh, and therefore I would hope that that would be taken through COSLA, that uh, there should be recompense for rural authorities if the, if the Scottish Government does intend to take that in. So I just wondered, is that a consultation which is underway at the moment? or James? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, leader, um, in terms of rural exemptions for food waste, the Scottish Government have asked the question. You'll be aware, uh, or you may be aware, that there is a big push to... Uh, on food waste as, as one of the target areas for reduce, reducing uh, the amount of waste that ends up in residual waste. We have we've been asked um, nationally what we provide in terms of food waste service, and the information we provided them was that we have it in the Wigton area, but it's limited to Stranraer. The rollout will be to the five postcode, six postcode areas as per the rural exemptions, and that and we also added into that response. That if we were, if, if the rural exemptions ended, it would be a cost to this authority of in the order of eight hundred thousand pounds to um, to roll that out. So we believe that um, you know they they understand that issue. To be fair, I think that one of the responses I got back in terms of an informal discussion with Zero Waste Scotland is uh, it's the bigger users of. Uh, so if you've got a, a hotel uh, in a rural area, um, then it can potentially be exempt. From the collection service, even though it's producing a lot of food waste, so there's maybe opportunities to improve recycling of food waste, or you know, keeping it out of the, the general waste stream without being as as sort of one rule across the whole of Scotland. But it's still in discussion within in, in, in uh, 
the Scottish Government. But we'll, we will push back, don't worry. I know as part of the COSLA e and &E board and also APSE and National, we're continually on at the Scottish Government about what does this actually mean for local authorities, what about you know the, the, the funding that requires us, potential for jobs and all that sort of thing that we're, we're looking at. So yeah, I think I think there's there's always that question that needs to be an, asked by um, all elected members at different levels throughout, throughout the UK. John. Yeah, thanks, Chair, for letting me back in. Uh, Councillor Hagman sort of touched on the point about communications. Uh, j just one thing I would like to bring up on that, you know, if, uh, you know, say somebody comes into the region, they're not aware of the, the council's policy, uh, curbside recycling, you know, uh, could there be communication be passed through, say, a leaflet with the council tax or something like that, you know, so that people are aware. Uh, the, the other point that I wanted to raise was the operation policy procedures in Appendix 2. Uh, I mean, there's a wealth of information in there, you know, it, it actually tells you what you can do, what you shouldn't do, etc, etc. Uh, I'm just wondering, if, is this available on our website and is it easily ac accessible, uh, as most of us know, when you try to get onto the council website, try to find things, uh, it seems to be hidden away somewhere, but I'm just hoping it will be easily accessible for members of the public. Josh? Yep. Hi. Um, well, the intention is once it's been passed by uh, committee, uh, that it will be published in, on uh, the council website, uh, and we'll be using the web pages that we've designed so far to make that information available. Pauline. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, James and t team, for the community conversations, which seemed to go down extremely well. We had a great turnout at Kirkubri. Um, from that, we've had further conversations with constituents and people contacting us. And I go back to Councillor Hagman's point about the timing plan. We're, we're going to have a number of opportunities for constituents with regards to choices, I think, which is great, actually, because I obviously had concerns about there only being one size bin in the first instance with the size of our households. So consumers will have a choice of a 240 bin, a 140 bin, road end collection or not, as the case may be, with regards to the stipulations you're putting in place group collections and smaller properties, and also the proposed weighted bags, which went down extremely well with our elderly groups in Kirkubri. What I would like to ask with regards to the timing plan, James, and I hope this makes sense, is that we have some kind of staggered implementation plan, and it will, if that is the case, might it be helpful um, for constituents phoning up to ask questions, um, have different requests, and will there be a dedicated phone line? Because a lot of our elderly don't um, go online to access that sort of information. So um, really, James and Janice, I'm asking, will there be a dedicated line when we implement the system? And I know that more information may need to come on that. Thank you. James? Um, I mean, certainly we can take on board that comment, uh, Councillor, and uh, I, I don't see that it's a, an un unrealistic request. Um, we've, we've some ideas for uh, how we would promote the service, uh, the new service. It's principally keeping it very simple in terms of the message. Just this is what we want in this bin, this is what we want in that bin, and avoiding the contamination issues, which then increased our cost for disposal. Um, if we if we feel after a period of time of operation, this is something we've kicked about with the team, um, we will obviously have a message that goes out initially. Once we've rolled it out, for once it's been in operation for a number of months, we would then start to look to do targeted campaigning or targeted message information sharing on areas where we're seeing higher contamination rates or less recycling uh, to, to avoid, you know, treating everybody the same. Because we think there will be communities, water community councils, we had a very productive meeting with um, Lockside Community Council. If we can get champions within community councils to encourage their, 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 you know, their community to buy into this, then we may not need to do targeted kind of uh, information sharing. So we, we want to work in, in lots of different ways. But we're going to take advice from Zero Waste Scotland, uh, support from them in the next couple of weeks. We're meeting with them, so we'll keep you posted. That's helpful, James. Thank you. You okay if I come in, Chair? Um, I think, obviously, my fear, and I guess other people in the room and within the communities, is that we give everybody a 240 bin and then we've got an excess. So it's going to be quite difficult to manage. And I don't quite know how that's going to be done. Um, it is very challenging for you, I accept that. Uh, you know, actually what people want, because we could be giving out plastic bins to a lot of um, smaller households or elderly households and in effect they'll be 
in excess. We've paid and bought for them all, and they actually just want the smaller weighted bags. So I, I guess we'll just, in the future, have some kind of plan for that going forward before we implement it, James. Thanks. Can I just come back on that and just emphasise one of the points within the, the committee paper, which is, is quite a, a strong stance that we're proposing to take, and I think it's worth emphasising it to, to yourselves, um, because ultimately the decision is, is taken by yourselves. But what we're saying is that um, if you currently have a wheelie bin, you will be getting wheelie bins. Um, we would not be looking to issue sacks to people who have space, or currently have wheelie bins, who have space for new wheelie bins. And the reason being is that one of our biggest challenges in the west of the region with the curbside collection service was the manual handling associated with bending and lifting. If we go, we accept that people can't all accommodate wheelie bins. So in those cases, they have at present orange sacks, which they put their rubbish out in. But that adds to the time of collection. It's obviously a cost in providing orange sacks that are you know, just disposed of. Um, so we're looking at uh, replacing the orange sacks potentially with the, Hesse, the bigger Hessian sacks that they'll put their own rubbish in. So they're reusable that we've been using the seagull trials. But for anybody that has currently got a wheelie bin, they will get two additional wheelie bins. And the, the other point is if they ask for smaller wheelie bins for dry recyclates, they only get the small wheelie bins for dry recyclates if they take a small wheelie bin for their residual waste. And the point, the reason for that is that if we give them a large, if they're, if they're a single occupancy and they take a large, two, they have a 240 wheelie bin for their dry recycle, for their general waste, and two smaller bins, then there's no reduction in space that will encourage them to recycle. So one of the ways of doing it is to provide them as much capacity in the dry recyclates, so you recycle, and less capacity in the residual waste bin. So it's it's that point. And at the moment, technically, we're providing Zero Waste Scotland recommendations is 70 litres per property per week. So 100, uh, sorry, 70 or 80 litres per property per week. So about 140 to 160 litres we're providing 240 litres, which is 50% more by having a fortnight of the collection service. So we want to minimise the amount of uh, avoidance of, of recycling by restricting to the, the, the national standard of 80 litres per property per week. Ian, these are small points. So last week, in it's not the first time, maybe the first time in Rutherwell and Clansfield area, but obviously I raised concerns in regards to so the vehicles are breaking down there, the end of life, and we accept that. And I certainly conveyed that back to the uh, local constituents and community council have been in touch with me in that area. But just in the future, how long do you think this is going to last for? So the, the spare wagon, the wagon broke down, the spare wagon was already broken down. Uh, and like I say, we do accept that, but going back to some points that I raised earlier, how long will this be? Because there's another week, so there's a fortnight, becomes a fortnight collection. How long uh, will this go on for, do we think? And is there any other types of mitigation we can put in place to make sure this doesn't happen again? I mean, the, the, the main idea for the new wagons is a five-year cycle, so hopefully that'll never happen once we get into the new system, Ian, but um, is there anything else happening at the moment to, to mitigate against the breakdowns? Um, just to give you some idea of quantity of the breakdowns that we experienced, last month alone we had 10 routes missed, um, and that was due to adverse weather, um, breakdowns, but also the availability of no spare vehicle. Um, Behind the scenes, we're, we're constantly juggling vehicles between Stranraer, Cass Douglas, Dumfries, and Anne and Dale Nestle because we're all in the same situation. And we're trying our utmost to keep the service on the road as much as we can. And I appreciate um, the frustration of members of the public that you know, we've broken down. We are trying our best, but if we were to go out and hire vehicles, it would cost about £1,000 a week per vehicle. Uh, and we might be looking at four, probably on a weekly basis. So you have to balance that up against the ongoing cost. So as part of my comments, Chairman, I'll leave it after this, is come back to the, the previous uh, query I put in last week. We have a 2% uh, for, for emergencies, which is £6 million for the Council's. I think Council's, uh, it's a, a form of contingency, I would say, but certainly for emergencies and such. Like, I do feel that in the right circumstances, uh, it could be dipped in. It, obviously, there's, there's budget proposals coming up, so on and so forth. It may well help address it, may not. I don't really see it well because it's a longer term plan. But ultimately, I've got the assurance that vulnerable people in particular, uh, so if an elderly person or somebody of particular medical needs felt that they, they absolutely they had been had to be emptied, they've got the assurance that that would be taken care of on a case by case. But it's something we have to, we've, we've, we've not all timelines, and that's difficult to convey back to your constituents as you're well aware. 
I think one of the issues, of course, is not a decision making subcommittee. This is about the, the uh, um, making sure the implementation actually happens or the, the new side of things. That would be something I think would be answered at communities rather as rather as here. So, um, is there any other, Jim? Thanks, Chair. With regard to the black boxes, will they still be offered to households in Lincolnshire? Because we are sitting just now with three and in some cases four black boxes in our gardens. <clears throat> James? Sorry, can I just seek some clarity in, in terms of additional boxes for them to to use internally rather than putting them out? Or, I mean, I've, I've no issue with, we, we have a number of boxes uh, in stock, so I don't think we'll have the full run on all of them, um, but it, it, for what? Particular additional purpose would require more boxes. The, the point I'm trying to make, James, we have currently, I would say, sufficient blank boxes, but there may be households which insist on being treated the same as the rest of the Friesian Galloway. Certainly we will take a, a, a selection of the boxes to the three HWRCs in the Wigton area, so Newton Stewart, uh, Whithorn and Stranraer, and if the members of the public wish to collect per property uh, additional boxes, then we've no issue with that. We've never really had an issue with issuing additional boxes in, in the area, and we use the community conversations actually to, to provide additional boxes, so um, not a problem at all, Councillor. Okay, so on that we'll go to the recommendations, and I'm only going to uh, ask you to uh, record either the note or the green, because there's so many of them. So are we happy to note 2.1? Note 2.2? Agree 2.3 with the addition of the um, opportunities for households? Um, thank you, Chair. Just, I will, we've got in the, in the narrative here that one box would be issued to each house, but we've actually had confirmation that up to three boxes. So can we change that to up to three boxes? We're happy with that. Yep. Okay. If, if people are looking for. Yep. Uh, note 2.4. Agree 2.5. Agree 2.6. Note 2.7. Note 2.8. With a review of the um, policies and procedures in 2.9. Uh, we've noted the, two, the feedback in 2.10. And 2.11, note the proposals to develop the tender documents. We're happy with that. Thank you very much. We'll now go on to item number five, which is the Waste Strategy Development of the Free Shiro Waste Park, report by the Heads of Roads and Infrastructure. This report provides members with the current version of the development proposals and timelines for delivery for the Free Shiro Waste Park and seek feedback ahead of seeking approval at Communities Committee on the 10th of March 2020 for the project to be considered <coughs> as a priority project in the Council's Capital Investment Strategy. Uh, have you got anything to add to the report, Steve? Nothing to add to the report, Chair. Okay. John. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'm getting quite excited with this. Uh, it looks like a fantastic facility that the Council will have. Uh, the, the only question I've got really is on page 60 on Appendix 3. Uh, it says that the rateable value of the site will be significantly higher than the current facility, which is obvious. Uh, but I'm just wondering if we had a sort of a, a rough idea of what that rateable value possibly could be. Adrian? Uh, that's still to be determined. So, sorry, we're, we're, we're just waiting back from the... Uh Right section to establish that. Yeah. Just in regards to the timelines in the appendix, I've got a page. Oh, it's page fifty-seven. So I'm just looking at the the planning application, the building one application. Uh, I just because of the information we've been receiving as local members uh, recently, I think I just wondered why are they not being applied for at the same time? Quite often that's a traditional way of doing it, but there's no reason for them not to be applied for at the same time. And as it stands, building wants are taking much longer as. Plan applications to be determined. We think it used to be the way it's been presented here. It certainly was a wee while ago. But as it stands, minimum twelve-week timeline leading for building warrants. Unless we had a particular influence over this this one, but 
I don't see any particular reason why they're, they're not going in at the same time. Adrian? Uh, I think just because there's probably more detail to go into the building warrant that uh, that the architects are still working on, so it's just, just to make sure we keep on track. I suppose if that's the case, but I, mean, I think for the awareness, because mem local members are certainly aware that it, it's been a lot longer now, it's taken at least three months uh, for, a, for a building warrant, and obviously can't start work before that building warrant's in place. James? Can I just add to that that obviously the um, property and architectural services leading on the, the as, as principal designer have had uh, pre-planning application uh, discussions with the, the planners um, and, a, and regular contact with um, with our building um, control colleagues as well, Max. So it is it is quite in. I'm confident with 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 Alan Hewitt and his team that this is very much in hand. Tom. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we've been asked, Chair, to consider this as a priority project to go forward to the Communities Committee. I'm just wondering how we can consider this to be a priority project when we don't see what it's to be compared against. Steve? So the, the, the terminology is within the, cap, the Council's Capital Investment Strategy, which is comprised of asset class for maintenance, but a, a series of priority projects the Council takes forward, uh, like the flood protection schemes, uh, like Dumfries Learning Town 2, and what we're asking for here in terms of Communities Committee is to consider this as uh, uh, for, for seeking for it to be included within the Council's Capital Investment Strategy as a, as a priority project within that uh, funding stream. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm looking at the timeline before us today, and it states of 3.2.3 that the planning application submitted the week commencing the 2nd of March. So has the planning application already been submitted prior to coming to this subcommittee and then going to the parent committee at Communities? So that was my first question. Um, I had a couple of comments on Appendix 1, which is our, our new plan, that either has or has not gone to, to planning as yet. Um, within the staff car park and within the RCV parking, has there been provision made for electric charging points in both of those? And in terms of all the green area, um, there's a lot of talk about our climate action plan and how we move forward in carbon. One of the issues that isn't brought up very often is biodiversity, and it's one that I would, do, would look to champion. All that green area, can we ensure that the landscaping is done to maximise the biodiversity around that site with potentially native trees and other um, landscaping that, as I say, is going to enhance the biodiversity of the region? Adrian? Okay. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the site plan, uh, yes, there will be electric points in, in both the staff car parking and the, uh, the visitor parking area. Uh, we're putting in infrastructure to allow us to extend that to all of the. Uh, I think it, I think it's a ratio of one to two. We're expected to uh, allow to later date. Yes, the same for the RCB parking. Yeah. Um, in terms of the green infrastructure, as a, as a landscape architect, I'm quite keen on this, uh, and uh, we will be incorporating measures to promote not not only biodiversity but also using tree planting, for example, to to reduce potential risk from dusk dust. Okay, uh, Malcolm. Thank you, Chair. It's page 60 of the Appendix 3, and uh, given the Council's uh, climate change strategy, I find it a wee bit surprising that we have not considered active travel options, and it's in here as a potential uh, cost increase or a potential delay, but I was under the under impression that... Uh, Climate action was at, to, to be at the centre of basically every decision in the, in the council. So I'm curious to see how much extra time would it add to incorporate some form of active travel arrangements for this particular site and then how much cost would add to it. Because I'm well aware of the fact that in that area, and obviously in the site, it's quite difficult to get out there. I fully understand that. And we've also got 
a number of industrial estates out that side of town with no public transport options for them. So I'm just a bit surprised that this wasn't highlighted sooner and wasn't built into the plan right from the start. Adrian, you welcome. So in terms of, uh, of active travel, we are looking at um, what, sorry, one of the um, amendments to the plan that's, that's in the appendix is there's actually a, a bus stop included in the site. It was, this was an oversight. It was, it was on the original versions and the version that's going to planning uh, includes that. Uh, so we, we need to talk to the uh, bus operators to encourage them to turn into the site, drop off at that bus stop and, and continue. Uh, we're also looking at um, options. There is the, 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 the idea of a, of a council bus going around to different depots. It might be too far out of town to include that, but that's one thing we're looking at. Uh, in terms of uh, whether we could extend a cycle route to the site, that's, that's the part that would, would take longer and would be more complex. Okay, but there may be options with such strands if we actually ask ask for that situation. Steve, did you want to come in earlier on? Okay, uh, no more questions. We'll go to the recommendations then. Uh, 2.1, we're asked to note the background of the development of Dumfrieshire Waste Park as detailed in paragraphs 3.1.1 to 3.1.5 and at 2.2, <coughs> agree to recommend the community's committee approval of the progression of the development of the Free Zero Waste Park project as detailed in paragraph 3.26. Are we happy with that? Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, so we're now moving on to item number six, which is Waste Strategy Update on Cessation of Task and Finish, report by Heads of Roads and Infrastructure. And this report provides members with an update on the cessation of task and finish working arrangements within the waste collection service. Um, there are some questions I know about um, the the um, recommendations to go to communities from the um, from the members here. Is there anything to add to this, James, about where we are? Anything else to add? No? Steve, no. Okay, members open for uh, questions. Leader? Just a wee bit of clarification on page 63, 3.3.2. Um, which discusses the feedback survey results, and you state that the weighted results favoured option three, a four-day week, slightly ahead of the status quo. Option four, a five-day week. Members are asked to note that the, at this time the intention is to remain on a five-day week. And I just wondered, is that until the new system comes in that we're just continuing with the status quo, or are we basically ignoring the results of the survey? Janice? Uh, the decision to remain on the five-day week, um, purely it will make it far more easy for us to implement a new service based on the current existing routes uh, without any, any disruption to the, the, the public on their collection day. The way that the new service will operate is that the, the new paper and cardboard collection rounds and the cans and plastics rounds will replicate the existing current general rounds. So if your day is on a Monday, you will continue to get your Monday collected, your waste collected on a Monday for your paper and cardboard and your cans and plastic. If we were to look at a four day week, we would have to reroute every single property and probably involve quite a considerable time and disruption to uh, the, the householders. And, and in that case, why did we actually undertake the survey in the first place? Because you're suggesting to the workforce that things could change and then we're not going to pay any attention to it. <laughs> Steve, Steve's got a comment. In, in terms of designing the consultation, we, we, we took advice from HR, and it was very much about all, all the options were on the table for discussion with, with staff and, and with, with the unions who, who were kind of involved in the process as well through the, through the five workshops. The, the kind of marginal, in terms of those that voted, and there was a marginal preference for a four-day working week over a five-day working week, what we did get in the text responses, though, was a lot of uh, concerns about the ability of, given the age profile, without saying too much about that, of the workforce, of their ability to run uh, on kind of four, nine hour type days rather than five, seven point something days. Uh, and certainly the feedback from, from the unions as well was very much along the lines of concerns in changing the terms and conditions to, to, to move to a four day week 
in terms of the, the ability, the physical demands of the job on the workforce. As, as we had come into the, uh, the, the start of the workshops, uh, we, we had ideas about how we would make a four day week work as we came through and we got that kind of feedback. Uh, it became apparent that it would be quite difficult in terms of um, a, a significant percentage of the workforce to, 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 to bring about those changes. And for the present time, we want to implement the cessation of task and finish. Uh, that's, that's, that's the main thing in terms of getting consistency across the region on the operating hours for the collection service and bring in the new service uh, and minimise the kind of changes to, to kind of collection routes that that would bring uh, and that, that the five day working uh, uh, lets us achieve that more readily. It's not off the table, uh, but it is something uh, that we, we can look at again in the future. But I think we're unconvinced as, as managers uh, uh, that, that, that the service could, could cope physically, uh, or elements of the service could cope physically with the demands, and we would be concerned about the kind of health and safety implica implications of that. James, you want to just, just to add one further point, one of the, the reasons for a four-day week being put forward was that it's something that other authorities have looked at. Um, when you're taking away uh, what is currently seen by some staff correctly or incorrectly as you know, finishing early, and that was a criticism of task and finish, then the option that a four-day week could be considered as an option for the, the staff as a, a kind of, well, we're, we're not getting to stop at early afternoon, but four-day week would be a good alternative to that. Actually, what we, as management, there was a thought that that may be a preferred option and there may be a, a big buy-in to that. But actually, as, as, as Stephen and, and uh, Janice have, have said, th th it wasn't as clear-cut as that. A lot of them were quite happy to stay with a five-day week and for the additional uh, cost of, of you know, the, or the hassle to rolling out not only a new curbside collection service, but then telling them you're going to have it on a different day of the week. Um, you know, the benefits were not obviously there. So it was very much an engagement with our, our, our trade unions and workforce to see what they would prefer. I, I can remember a few years ago, probably even eight years ago, somebody would somebody say to me, they're going to get, get this task and finish finished in a year's time. So it's taken, you know, quite a bit of time to get this sort of... I know I'm guilty of not looking across to my right. I don't know, Katie, if you wanted to come in. All right. Okay, so we'll go to the recommendations then. Um, we're asked to... Uh, note 2.1, the background and progress to date regarding the cessation of task and finish as detailed in section 3.1. We're asked to note 2.2, new working arrangements will be effect from 16th of March 2020 as detailed in paragraph 3.2.14. And note the 2.3, feedback received from the waste collection service, workforce from preferred work patterns as detailed in section 3.3. Happy with that? Thank you. We'll then move on to the waste strategy development of transformation events output report by the Head of uh, Roads and Infrastructure. This report provides members with details of the options developed as outputs from the transformation events held on 23rd and 27th of September 2019. Um, Steve, got anything to add to the, the, the report? Nothing to add, Chair, thank you. James, anything to add to the report? Okay. Uh, <coughs> so members, uh, it's open for questions. John? Yeah, just a quick one, Chair. It's, uh, we're asked to consider the seven proposals, uh, but we're asked to consider when uh, a number of them um, uh, are still to be quantified. Uh, I don't know how we can do that, but uh, maybe you can help us out. Steve? So the, the, the proposals are arising from the transformation events, the recycling and litter transformation events that we held towards the end of last year, and they have been reported back to Finance Procurement and Transformation Committee and the decision was taken there that they would be uh, that the service committee, in this case communities committee, would be tasked to work up the detail to deliver uh, the potential savings and the potential transformation that can come forward. Uh, this is this is as far as the, the the proposals have been developed. What the report contains is all the kind of it's trying to capture all the feedback from the two transformation events, all the ideas that were coming out of the public and the staff that were involved, and we have captured those into a series of, of propositions. Uh, that need uh, to be developed further. We've, we've put indicative timescales on them. We've identified where there might be uh, that, that there might be the potential for savings, and we've also identified where there's a need for investment in terms of additional uh, resource. Because in effect, we've been asked to do uh, additional work. Uh, a lot of the, the feedback that came from the transformation events was was not so much about kind of changing practical physical processes as about changing kind of customer consumer uh, behaviour in terms of creating waste and in terms of reducing 
uh, litter. Uh, and we're looking at uh, actually how we would resource that. So we, in terms of future savings, this, this further work requires to be done in a number of proposals to identify, particularly in relation to the Echo Deco and the MBT, changes to the plant there. I would imagine that's probably a process that we will we'll always be active in, in terms of monitoring year on year how the plant runs, the efficiency of it. Is it still the best uh, solution for us? Uh, we're you know, kind of halfway through its, its originally anticipated service life. Uh, we, we need to be able to populate or, or be able to inform those decisions if it continue to run it for another 10 plus years uh, and uh, understand what we're going to do with the offtakes, what's the optimum, uh, the minimum price for our offtakes to, to reduce the, the strain on the budget and what's the kind of you know maximisation of income if we look at bringing additional material in. So what, what we've done in the transformation proposals is flag up. I, I think effectively what we're providing here for this committee is, is, a, is a view of the future. Uh, some of the areas where change will come. The earlier reports are all about the kind of change that we're implementing and have agreement for uh, and will roll out over the next year. This is the kind of next work package for the team in terms of embracing the future of the service. Uh, James talked earlier about being kind of flexible and certainly everything we do in terms of the design of the service, we want to be able to accommodate changes in legislation in the future, changes in kind of consumer uh, use in terms of creating waste. Uh, and this is the, the kind of the, the set of proposals that we will we'll bring to flesh out, bring to communities committee, and we will seek their approval on the detail of that. Yeah, thanks for that. The, I suppose uh, recommendation 2.3 should really be noting, uh, you know, the transformation events that have taken place and, and the information that's in this paper, rather than considering. Because I mean, if we're considering something, that gives us does that not give us the option that we could put up or further recommendations? I think if you were, you're considering the, the, the information we have available on these proposals and if there was particular ideas, uh, the, the, I suppose the reality check for us is that we, we have captured all the ideas in terms of the transformation events and to some extent FPT committee we're, we're doing that kind of due diligence process. This is really here for, for, for this committee who are kind of um, embracing themselves and, and looking at the strategy for the waste service, looking at the future, other, other tweaks to these proposals that you know would come forward that would be uh, come forward as kind of comments and feedback to the Communities Committee uh, and it's really an opportunity for the subcommittee to, to, to review those proposals if they wanted to feed anything back to, to communities. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, Stephen said this is an opportunity. I don't sit in communities myself. I'm not sure this entirely sits within the delegation for this committee because this is looking at future and we're looking at the rollout of the new waste strategy. However, I will take this opportunity because it's been presented to me to make a few comments. Um, in terms of the opportunities for future, on page 105, it makes reference to home composting. Could we maybe perhaps including that for um, both cooked food and non-cooked food because they're two different types of recycling or not composting systems and also can we look at potentially school recycling school composting i'm aware some of our schools already do especially in some of the primary schools and in terms of the point made by Stephen, in terms of educating the community the communities and the members of the public are actually very well educated and getting more and more educated on this subject as we move forward. So I think the bottom point, or the bottom bullet point on the left, on page 105, lobbying of supermarkets, I think that needs to be a really strong message that the council puts out there because actually consumers are wanting to do this and the supermarkets are not enabling them to do so. But that was just my two comments for, for noting, please. And I'm sure the officer would be happy to take them forward as part of the consultation. Pauline. Thank you, Chair. I'm following up to Councillor Hagman, but on a different point and taking this opportunity as well. Daily, I would say, I get stressful emails from constituents, and it's all to do with littering. And I know this is about waste management, but to me, this is a sub of roadside littering. And correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, is the A75 litter picking co a cost to us as a council, or is that transfer serve Scottish Government? But for side roads as well, I would like to really love to see some tra transformation events or community events and hopefully take forward some creative ideas as to how Dumfries and Galloway Council could be one step ahead to keep attracting more people to the area without the absolute horrendous littering we seem to be experiencing at the moment, especially in rural areas. And it's, a lot of it's coming from um, carry-out shops by the time they get out to the east or the west of Dumfries. Um, and I'm just wondering, Stephen, if there is a way, and team, if there's a way that we could 
come up with some idea as we used to have in the past with signage, which might in turn reduce the long-term cost for our council. Thank you. I know, I know that um, you know we, we, the, the trunk road maintenance is, 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 a, is a, a contractor issue with Transport Scotland, but with the, the grass cutting and all that, and when people put litter down, you put grass cutting, you get the confetti of all the plastics and all that. And that. So that's being discussed very much at the sort of higher levels, causal level, and things like that with regards whose responsibility is at the moment. Under the legislation as it stands, it is a local authority's responsibility to collect the litter. However, that has been in place for the last 20 years. And there are obviously n new roads that have come in place in, in, in that particular area as well. So there are discussions with, for instance, Association of Public Service Excellence, um, COSLA, SOLAS, about whose responsibility actually is. And we do want to reduce the amount of litter. And there is on the A75. Steve, do you want to? Yep, so the, the cost of collecting litter on the A75 and the trunk roads is, does fall to the council as, as, as the litter authority. It's actually the, it's the proposal under street scene in page 110 that's not to do with the service, that, 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 that it's not specifically for the waste service, it's the, the street scene service that sits under Harry Hay, but it's, it was part of our transformation proposal and there's that connection and we're working across the two services on this proposal so we can, we can feed back that in terms of the rural litter signage uh, and uh, the ideas on reducing litter uh, to to that kind of project proposal as that develops. I think it also sits well with the last proposal, which very much does sit with this team in terms of the waste and litter prevention awareness. And we're looking at the future, how we might resource a, a post in terms of a waste prevention officer. And that would be about education and kind of campaigns. Uh, obviously, the litter reduction helps our colleagues in street scene because they have less uh, less cost. The waste reduction helps us dramatically in terms of reducing the cost of what we're processing, and if we can uh, uh, work on that in terms of the, the the kind of the littering in the rural area, in terms of the environment, then we can we can we can see how we can work that in as well when we we're, we're able to develop the project with the resource. That would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, I'm sorry, Jim, do you want to come in first? I'm uh, just going to add, Chair. I mean, not a, <coughs> this, this is a. Uh, sort of support is not a solution to the the problem. We should be discouraging people from throwing away litter, but we should also be mindful that uh, Jamie James uh, and and the team there uh, very much support public uh, support in terms of litter picking and provide all the equipment to communities and provide free collection of all waste collected at roadside. So gloves, uh, the helping hand picker, litter picker things, and. Uh, reflective vests as well for for anybody that wishes to do that as a sort of community, um, you know, sort of improvement to an area. So we we would support that. It's not a solution. It, it's dealing with the. It's not dealing with the problem, but but it, it it is something that's that's there and should be made. Community should be made available. I absolutely agree with that. And, and, and the the issue was a seventy five and 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 the issue of risk assessments and things like that. Where community groups actually picking on a seventy five could be a big big problem for, for us. But that, again, it coming back to keep, keep Scotland tidy for, tidy for instance, they have got some campaigns ongoing and we did use them at the first part of the A75 at Gretna there for the last, last couple of years and it did reduce the amount of litter that was actually on there. Uh, and that was, that was actually taking away bins as well. So there is potential there. Jeff? Just thinking about the, the uh, introduction of the uh, deposit return scheme, hopefully that will have some impact on the amount of uh, bottles and containers which are thrown out of uh, car windows. But if we're collecting it, would we also qualify for the 20 pence from each of these bottles with local communities? I mean, it could possibly be an income stream. <laughs> is, is that your answer to entrepreneurship, <laughs> That solves the council's budget problems, I think. Okay, uh, any other questions? We'll go to the recommendations then. Uh, we are asked to note 2.1 the outputs from the recycling letter transformation events held on the 23rd and 27th of September 2019 as they relate to the waste service and future development of the strategy. We are asked to note 2.2 the potential for savings and improvement service delivery and associated timescales as detailed in Appendix 2. And I think we have considered these seven proposals uh, uh, to assist in further consideration of future budget saving operations within the waste service. Are we happy with that? Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any other business at the moment, but I do have a, 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 maybe a, a question of the, uh, the subcommittee support in this. Um, this is a short-lived subcommittee, uh, and any sort of future 
things that come from this 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 subcommittee goes to communities for actually you know the the, the results of of any recommendations going there. Um, I would like to ask the scheme of delegation because this was a short-lived waste implementation subcommittee. Uh, we've now seen that we are getting the implementation and in, in stacked up, but the decisions are always going to be to the communities. So I'm, I'm going to ask the, the committee's approval to go to scheme of delegations that we now hand back over to the communities uh, committee that the, this, this will go forward. However, what I will suggest is also saying that we still meet with the economic action groups that we're actually doing at the moment and the, re the refurnishing char charities that are across the, the area as well. Um, to make sure that anything they suggest can go forward to communities committee as part of that. Could I have that um, sort of approval to write the scheme of delegations and say that we, would, we think we're now in the, the stage to get the, the, the implementation back to communities? Thank you, Chair, for, um, for that. Um, if you were going to go down, as, as you suggest, with that and take that, I presume, to standing orders subcommittee who would then make the recommendations. Um, and I'm aware that the Waste Strategy Subcommittee was one that was earmarked as a potential trial for the digital technology. So therefore, if this committee is no longer going to be meeting in this format, can we request that the Standing Orders Subcommittee select another committee to trial the rollout of technology? Just because I, I'm, my understanding is this was one of the subcommittees that they were looking at doing that with. I think from regard to the, the information technology, that would be all part of the implementation of the waste strategy. Anyway, that, would, that would go to communities um, committing for that decision. Steve, would you? Um, I think what Councillor Hagman's asking is that there's, there's another subcommittee yes. identified yeah. for the use of digital for, for rather than physical presence yeah. of members. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, we can, I mean, we, 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 we could, if harbours are not, we could probably volunteer yeah. harbours. They're on there as well. They're on there as well, okay, right. So. We, we maybe need to capture that then in the feedback that, that, that you're looking for another committee. I, I think I'll put that in the letter to the um, scheme. All right. Members happy with that? No. Thank you, Chair. Just to, to say, given that we have uh, brought, you know, implementing, we are implementing the strategy, the decisions do go back to the Communities Committee. I think it's, it's only sensible that that route is taken. And just on the back of what uh, Councillor Hagman was saying, I would be very supportive of the Harbour Subcommittee taking on the on the trial. <laughs> okay, members, there's nothing further. Thank you very much for your attendance, and I'll close the meeting at that. Thank you. <laughs>